Go with me. We're going back to Luke. I'm going to do a real abbreviated version of this message this morning. Real abbreviated. Even more abbreviated than I had intended to do it. But I just want to take us through, and I want us to look at Jesus, our example, in the book of Luke. So Luke, chapter 3, at the end, starting with verse um, 21. And I want to begin this morning by talking about being initiated into something. Being initiated, has anybody in here ever been initiated into anything? Right? Initiated into, uh, the only example that I can think of for my life, uh, it's probably not a real great example, but I was initiated into a fraternity um, when I was, a Greek fraternity when I was in college. And um, that initiation meant something. It meant that it identified with me with another group of people who are also initiated into that particular thing. So I want us to think about the idea of being initiated into something for the purpose of identification with, with them, with that group. And so let me just read to you Luke 3, 21 to 23a. I'm not going to read all the genealogy today. But let me just read that, and then we'll get into the word. It says, now when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And the voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. Being as was supposed, the son of Joseph. And then he continues on with the genealogy. And what I want us to look at this morning real briefly is Jesus. As we see his baptism, his initiation into ministry, and Jesus' beginning, his identification with mankind, I want us to look at what Luke is showing us here. Why? Why are we seeing this? This comes on the heels of John the Baptist coming in being the forerunner for the Messiah. We're going to see Jesus basically being introduced publicly as he begins his ministry. Now, I know this is not the kind of scripture that makes us jump up and down and, oh, we're in the genealogies. Oh, we're into Jesus' baptism. But it's going to get good. What I love about Luke is it's going to get really good. As we see Jesus interacting with people, as we see him teaching people, but this is the beginning of his ministry. And if you have the papers that Patrick handed out this morning on the genealogies, you can follow along. And I actually have a cross-reference here uh, of the baptism accounts as well on that very page. Okay, so what does he show? First of all, 21 through 23a, we see Jesus' initiation into ministry. We see him coming in verse 21. It says, when all the people are baptized... What people? The one that John was baptizing. Remember, he was baptizing for the forgiveness, for the repentance of sin. So they were coming to be identified as John was preaching the truth of the kingdom of God. He was coming, they were coming to be baptized to identify with that repentance which they had made for the forgiveness of their sins before God. And so as they're doing that, Jesus is coming with them. He's being baptized. And what's interesting, if you look at the cross-reference in Matthew 3, 14 and 15, this is really interesting. It said, then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have no need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? So he's kind of confused. But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. So Jesus is coming. Can you just picture this? Can you visualize this? The people are coming to be baptized for their sins. They know why they're coming. And all of a sudden, can you imagine standing in line? Now the text doesn't tell us, but I, I'm going to believe that Jesus probably was the last in line. 
Okay? We don't, can't prove that. But I wonder if he wasn't the last in line. But can you imagine John seeing all the people coming? He's baptizing them for the forgiveness of their sins. And then he sees Jesus and goes, uh-oh, time out. We have a theological issue here. We got a problem here. I'm baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins. But behold, the Lamb of God standing in front of me. He doesn't need to be baptized for his forgiveness of sins because he's God. Right? And we're told in the Gospel of John that, that the Spirit helped him to recognize Jesus as the Son of God. So he's going to know he's the Son of God and going, oh, oh, we have a theological problem here. So he says, no, 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 Jesus. You don't get it. You should be baptizing me. I'm a sinner. I need to repent of my sins. You baptize me. And Jesus says, no, no, you don't get it. You got to do this. You have to do this to fulfill all righteous, part of God's plan. Now, I don't know about you, but it's always kind of caused me to wonder why in the world, what is Jesus saying here? Here's what the Lord put on my heart. I believe that as Jesus comes to be baptized with the people, he's identifying with them. I believe that this baptism for the forgiveness of sins is not for him, but he's identifying himself in this baptism with his ultimate identification by taking their sin on the cross. Now, think about this. Sin, baptism was for the purification of sin. It was a symbolic cleansing for their sin. Well, Jesus didn't need to be cleansed. But symbolically, symbolically, as he would on the cross eventually physically take their sins, I believe he's symbolically going through that baptism to represent the pur purification of sin that he's going to take for them three and a half years later. Okay, stop with me just for a second. Does anybody wow at that possible thought? That that's a connection? I had never seen that before. Never seen that before until I was prepping the lesson this week. God doesn't do anything by accident. He's being baptized. He's, he's fulfilling God's plan. He's identifying with them. And last week we looked at Hebrews 1.3 that he became the purification for our sin and then sat down. So it's like God's kind of given a foreshadowing symbolically of what Jesus is going to do later on. Now it's interesting. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. Patrick and I were sitting down um, just this week. And he's going to be preaching next Sunday. But he's also going to be preaching in my absence in July, and he's going to be preaching in Romans 6. And we were talking about Romans 6 about baptism, right? And we know in, in Romans 6 that baptism is not physical baptism he's talking about. It's a spiritual baptism, but it's symbolized by a physical identification. In the same way here, I think this baptism as he comes, he's identifying himself in a symbolic way, in pointing toward what he's about to do in three and a half years as he takes the sin of the world on his shoulders. So that went, wow. Now watch this. This is interesting. As he's being baptized, okay, in Luke it says, now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, while he was praying. See, I think he gets baptized... Because he, be, he can't be praying while he's under the water, right? So if you look at the sequence of things, it seems as though he gets baptized, or maybe he's praying before he gets baptized, and while, he's, I think it's after, I honestly believe it's after, but while he's coming out of the water and he's praying, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes upon him like a dove. Just amazing. And by the way, for those people who argue that there's no such thing as the Trinity in Scripture, that somehow Christians have made up that doctrine of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right here is a classic example of the Trinity all in one place at the same time. So you can't tell me the doctrine of the Trinity is not biblical because it's right here. Even though the word Trinity is not used, the concept, the truth of the Trinity is right here. All three of them are right here at the baptism. Obviously, Jesus is the one being baptized. But as he's praying, why is he praying? It doesn't tell us what he prays. I know there are other places that tell us what Jesus prays. We don't know what he prays. We can't, we can't decide what he's praying. 
But we know he's praying, and who is he praying to? God the Father, right? While he's praying. Now, it's interesting. Why would he be praying? Let me show you something in, in John 5, 19. This is just an example of Jesus' prayer, or, or example of why Jesus, I believe, prayed. In 519, Jesus is talking to his group of Jews, and he says to them, Therefore, Jesus' answer was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. It's a verse that tells us that he was completely dependent on the Father for everything. And you think, well, why in the world would the Son of God need to be dependent on the Father? Doesn't he know what to do? Yeah, but it shows their relationship, the dependence that he had on God for his whole ministry. So he's depending upon God for his ministry, but he's also receiving, now listen to what happens next. So the Holy Spirit comes upon him like a dove, right? Why does he come on him like a dove? In Luke 4, 1 and 14, we see that the power of the Spirit was on him as he goes into the desert. We're going to look at the temptation of Jesus in two weeks. As he goes into the desert, and we know that he has power for ministry in verse 14. So I believe what's going on here is that we're seeing the Old Testament empowerment for ministry that comes upon Jesus. And you say, well, what do you mean by Old Testament empowerment? Okay, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within believers permanently. But that's not the way it worked in the Old Testament. If you look carefully in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people for a time and a season to do ministry, and then, they, then he left. I believe this is kind of the segue between the Old and the New Testament in terms of the Holy Spirit coming. He comes to dwell on Jesus and empower Jesus to do the ministry that he's going to be doing. So Jesus is actually empowered by God himself, even though he is God, he's empowered by God for the ministry that's coming up. Now watch this, while the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, it doesn't say he is a dove, it says like a dove, who knows what that would have looked like, right? But he comes, and, and I believe the Holy Spirit remains on him, while this is going on, the heavens open, okay, Visualize that with me for a minute. The heavens split. Okay? This would have been a visual scene that would have been amazing. Okay? How many have you ever been to a rock concert in your days? You ever been to a rock concert? Okay? I've been to a bunch of rock concerts in my days, and some of those have the most amazing shows, light shows and all that kind of stuff. I don't think that's anything compared to what this would have looked like. The heavens split. And in the middle of that split, we hear a voice that comes out of heaven, and we know whose voice that is. It's God the Father's. It has to be, right? Because the Holy Spirit's on him. Jesus is in the water, so it's got to be God the Father speaking to him. And what does he say? He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Or another way of saying it, this is my, this is my Son, the one that I've set apart for the office of Messiah, like we talked about last week, right? He is the one that has my approval. I take pleasure in him. I approve of him. He pleases me. And what's interesting is in Luke 9.35, when God the Father speaks from heaven, he ad actually adds something to, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He actually adds this phrase, listen to him. Listen to him. God's approval comes on to Jesus. Now, why is that important? Because the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was truly God. But if they could look back on this incident and say, well, God the Father spoke about the Son and said, I approve of him. He is my Messiah. God is actually declaring right here in this instance that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be in the Gospel of John. He truly is my Messiah. Now, do you think God would have spoken from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased, and then adds later on, listen to him if he weren't really God? This is an authentication 
and an empowerment by God for ministry. Okay, that's the first part of these verses. Now, as we continue on in verses 23b through 38, so we see in the first set of verses the authentication or the approval by the Father and the anointing for ministry by the Spirit, they're all involved in that particular act of initiating Jesus into ministry through his baptism. Now we see in the, the identification with mankind, his ancestry which comes from mankind. Okay? Uh, we see the beginning of his ministry, John 1, 31 to 34. We don't see, we don't see um, this gospel account, we don't see Jesus actually being baptized by John, but he gives the account of the baptism, kind of his reflection on it. And he says this in John 1, 31. He says, I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I've seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and remained upon him. There's another witness to this, the fact that this actually happened. Not just Luke shared it, but John is saying, I saw it myself. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, and this would have been God, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. He came baptizing to be manifest. So the sign that Jesus truly was the Messiah is that to fulfill all righteousness, he would be baptized by John. This should have been another sign to Israel that this was the Messiah. I mean, how many signs do you need to give before people finally, you know, you finally have to say, you had all the signs in the world. How did you not recognize him? So he begins his ministry. Now watch the placement of the genealogy. Jesus' genealogy. It's given after the baptism. Where's Matthew's? It's at the beginning, at his birth. Right? And we're going to find out that there's a difference in the two genealogies. There's a different purpose in the two genealogies. I believe here, Luke gives the genealogy of Jesus back to Adam, not at the birth, but after the baptism to highlight the beginning of his ministry. To show this is the one. This truly is the one that came from God. Authenticated by God. Anointed by the Holy Spirit. This is his lineage. This is where he traces back to. Okay? And he came, again, like I said, to identify with man. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. So, in, in, in a sense... He's Messiah, but he carries multiple um, offices in a sense. According to the book of Hebrews, so if you look at the book of Hebrews, right? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, we're told that Jesus comes not only as the Messiah, but he comes as the high priest. It says, therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And then, verse 18, for since he himself was tempted in that which he was also suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Now let me just explain something real quickly. A high priest was chosen from among the people, and their role was to minister between God and man. So what we see here is Jesus' identification and baptism with humankind because he's going to be made like them. He's going to be human in a sense. Even though he's gone, he's going to be made like them from among the masses of people so that he can minister to them. Right? Part of the, the role of the high priest was to, he was part of the people. He could identify with their sins. He could identify with their temptations. Jesus is going to come He's going to identify with their sins, but not in the human sense. He's not going to be able to say, well, I, I, I've ever sinned because I haven't. But he was tempted, the scripture says, in all ways like us. So Jesus, can, nobody can ever look at Jesus and say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. Yeah, he can. The Bible says he was tempted in all ways and yet without sin. Right? So he can be that one that identifies with humankind and he does so 
through this human nature, through this human identification, okay? Now watch this. I just want to highlight real quickly, if you're looking at the list, okay, I gave you a list, and, and there, are, there are those that are highlighted in black, and then there's a, a bunch, there's a, there's a list of, okay, it goes from Joseph, it says, being the supposed son of God, or the supposed son of Joseph. Now, why would it say that? Okay? Well, the supposed, the reason why Luke says that is because who was his earthly father? He didn't really have it. Yeah, to the best, the best of Joseph's ability, he was his earthly father, but he really wasn't. He was his stepfather. Because he didn't derive his lineage from Joseph, right? Because if he had derived his lineage from Joseph, genealogically and, and, and through birth, he would have been a sinner. But he doesn't. He derives his human, na he derives his nature from God, but in a sense, Joseph is his father. For, from earthly reckoning, he's his father because he's the one that raised him. He was the husband of Mary. He would be the one that raised him, okay? So he was the supposed, and then it says, it's interesting, he began his earthly ministry around the age of 30. Which is really when Makes sense, which is really when these men would have begun their earthly ministry. Okay? So he's, he's the supposed son of God. Okay? Now watch this. If you look, that it, it says in his genealogy, who's his father? Eli, or Heli, Heli, right? Now, if you look over at the cross-reference to Matthew, we have the idea that his father was Jacob. So do Luke... And Matthew contradict each other? No, because the scripture doesn't contradict. So if you look back at what the scholars say, they'll, they'll reconcile the fact, they'll say this, that Heli, they believe, was Mary's father. That Jacob was Joseph's earthly father. And if you look at the lineages, they believe, the scholars believe, that Luke runs his genealogy through Mary's line, and that Matthew runs his genealogy through Joseph's line. And they both have individual reasons for their genealogies. Okay? Joseph, or Matthew's account, is to prove his legal line. To prove that he is in the line of all the kings that would come through David. Okay? Luke, on the other hand, is, I believe, proving that he go, his lineage goes back to Adam to prove that he comes through the lineage of mankind. Okay? I know it's hard to, it's hard to believe. And, and, uh, we're going to do some follow-up in CEF um, after this about that. Okay, so the similarities between Luke and Matthew, if you look at them, where the similarities are are in the areas of Abraham and around David. Those are all the, the similarities because what, what Matthew is proving is that Jesus truly is a descendant of Abraham, truly is a descendant of David as promised in those two covenants, and Luke will highlight those as well to prove the same thing. He will confirm what Matthew is saying to prove that he comes through the line of Abraham, and he comes through the line of David, okay? So there's differences. And if you look, it's interesting, if you look um, at the, the comparison of the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew and Luke, he's trying to prove, Matthew's trying to prove that Jesus is the Messiah through David's son, Solomon, who was promised to be the king after David, through which the, the lineage would come down to Messiah. Mary, on the other hand, the lineage is not through Solomon, it's through Nathan, another one of the sons. And I, here's, the, here's what I think is happening. I believe that Matthew, through his genealogy, is trying to prove that Jesus is the Messiah through Solomon, that Luke is trying to prove that Jesus is the universal Savior through another son, through Nathan. Now, do they contradict? No, because they're both sons, right? So it comes that way. And then ultimately, it's interesting, it comes back to the idea that his human nature. So look at the genealogy with me, okay? 
So it starts with Joseph, Eli runs itself through. You'll see, you'll see a couple of people mentioned Zerubbabel and Shealtiel. Those are two really important people who come out of the, um, the, the captivity. So they're the ones that, and, and God had promised that there would be no king sitting on the, the line of David because of one of the previous king's sins. And so Zerubbabel and Sheatil are actually, they're governors uh, after the, the, the exile who come back to Jerusalem. So technically they're kings, but they're not. And so the next king in line would be Jesus, right? And so you go on to genealogy. You see Nathan, David, Jesse, Obed, Boaz, Sam, and Nashon. And then it runs it all the way through, down through Abraham, the line of Abraham, and then all the way down to Seth, and then to Adam, and the scripture tells us in Luke, it calls Adam the son of God. The son of God. And you say, well, how is Adam the son of God? Think about it. He's the only one that was ever created that didn't come from a mom and a dad. He's the only one that was never born. So he is, he's a direct son of God in the fact that God created him, right? Right? And so it traces his line back through Adam. Now, why is this significant? And I'm just going to close on this. Why is this significant? Because in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, Paul compares the first and the second Adam. He compares the new Adam with the, the first Adam. Right? He actually calls Jesus the second Adam right? Adam came to be born. He was created, actually wasn't born, he was created to be perfect, right? And man, and he blew it in the garden. He sinned. He and Eve sinned. So what did Jesus come to do? He came to be the second Adam in the likeness of Adam, born in the flesh to undo or to do what Adam should have done in the first place. And he didn't, right? This is a tough message to preach when you get into genealogies. And I know it's hard to follow. But, but, he gives us that genealogy. And what we see here is we see basically Jesus' baptism. We see his beginning, his genealogy tracing all the way back to Adam. And I believe, I believe the purpose of that is to prove that Jesus Christ truly did come as a human being. Now, is that significant? Is it, is it theologically significant that Jesus came as a human being? You bet it is. Matter of fact, 1 John says that those who don't believe that Jesus Christ came as a man or came in the flesh are not really from God. And there are people today that teach that Jesus really didn't have a human nature. Oh, yes, he did. Did he have a godly nature? Absolutely. But he also came in human nature. And if you can figure that mystery out, please explain it to me. The fact that Jesus is both God and man at the same time. But he is. And I pray, I pray that this helps you to better understand Jesus as we begin to go into Luke. And next, or two weeks from now, we're going to look at his, um, his temptation. And remember what I said a minute ago, that Jesus wasn't, was tempted in every way? And yet without sin, well, we're going to see that in two weeks when we look at Jesus being tempted, but not giving in to temptation. Because why is that important? What's the problem theologically if Jesus gives in to temptation? What? He's no longer perfect, and then you and I are in trouble when it comes to the cross, okay? All right, so what I want to do, this, I want to segue this as we begin to recognize our graduates as we close out the service this morning.